Hello, everyone, and welcome in to another episode of the RTI and VR2 Recruiting Podcast. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, the managing editor of RockyTopInsider.com, joined by both Matt Ray and Brandon Martin of VR2 for this mailbag edition of the podcast. And guys, we have a ton of questions to get to. We're not going to be able to get to all of y'all's questions, unfortunately, because uh, looking at the uh, the tweet where I asked for questions, we had over two dozen questions, so we're not going to have time to sit here and answer all those unless we just sat here and did a, a two-hour podcast, which I don't think anybody wants to listen to, and I don't think we have time to do that. So <laughs> we'll get into it here, get right into some questions. First, before I get to any of the questions, actually, our listeners asked here, I, I have a thing that I want to bring up with you guys for us to kind of discuss briefly um, before we get into the questions. That's because no one asked it because it hasn't happened, I guess technically it hasn't happened yet, but it also happened very recently. We're recording this on Saturday afternoon. And the news came out kind of late Friday night that it looks like Ole Miss is going to be bringing the lane train back to the SEC. It looks like the Rebels are going to hire Lane Kiffin as their next head coach. I don't know that there's going to be a, a huge implications for Tennessee in the 2020 class in, in terms of you know how that affects them recruiting wise. But Matt Brandon, I, I I'm going to be very curious to see if this makes recruiting Memphis especially any more difficult for Tennessee because Kiffin's known as a obviously a very good recruiter. Ole Miss. Uh, historically, can be a pretty, you know, obviously with with Hugh Freeze cheating, that kind of that can change things. But even, even without that, they've been pretty decent at recruiting and doing a good job of recruiting kind of you know, West Tennessee and, and a little bit area right there. How much do you think this could affect Tennessee's recruiting? You know, maybe in this 2020 class too, but also down the line in 21 and 22. I don't think it's going to make a whole lot of difference in in this class. I think the guys that Tennessee wants, they're in a really, really good situation with. I think they're the guys that already committed, the Whitehaven guys, I feel like they're locked down. I think Tennessee's in a great spot with Amari Thomas. I feel like they're in a great spot with Jabari Small. Uh, Marcus Henderson, uh, He's sort of up in the air. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's a guy Lane will go after or not. Mm-hmm. But I think he's he's a guy they could look at. Uh, they may look at Darren Turner. Seems like a lot of guys, a lot of teams have passed on him uh, for whatever reason. So Turner's a kid that you you might see Kiffin try to make a splash with. And I think Chris Moore is a solid to A and M. I don't see him making a big difference in in this cycle. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting because we've not ever really seen Tennessee recruit Memphis hard while Ole Miss was good. Mm-hmm. Uh, when Ole Miss was doing so well with Hugh Freeze, even with the allegations, they recruited Memphis very well, but Tennessee didn't go after anybody in Memphis much. Uh, that has been very much a Jeremy Pruitt thing. He's recruited Memphis harder than any coach we've had in a long time. So that's that's made a big made a big difference. It'll be interesting to see them go head-to-head going forward, but Tennessee's already built some good inroads out there. They've done really well with some, with some of their top targets this year. Uh, they've done well with some top targets last year. I think that that consistency is going to help them and has established some relationships. So it'll be interesting to see them go head-to-head. Lane's going to get some guys, but I think Tennessee is still going to do well in Memphis. That seems to be a priority, and this whole staff can recruit. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I think it's more of a, a future concern for Kiffin there because, like you said, he's proving he can recruit. It's going to be interesting to see who he uh, – brings in on a staff at, at Ole Miss too because that, that could be the more intriguing thing not just not just Kiffin there, that, that's obviously extremely intriguing and I know I'm going to be following the Rebels a little bit closer now but also who he brings in as his you know his OC, although I imagine he'll be having a pretty strong hand on the uh, offensive side of the ball, but who brings in his DC his assistants, I, I think he could bring in a pretty good staff at Ole Miss. But now let's, let's jump into some of the questions we got here from our listeners, from the people who want to know uh, different things going on with Tennessee recruiting. Let's start with Matt Crawford on Twitter because we had him ask a question. Another person said they're following it and a couple people like the tweet. So I think this is a good place to start. He asks, who do y'all feel the most confident about Tennessee landing out of the players that have recently decommitted from other schools who Tennessee's pursuing? Um, he lists guys like Wren, Caho, Morvin Joseph, Fillinger. Um, he didn't mention Jamari, mention Jamari Smalls, but that's another one we can mention. Matt, out of all the guys who Tennessee either has recently offered, who's kind of turned the heat up, who do you feel the most confident in Tennessee landing of these most recent decommits? I, I, I'm going to say, as of right now, I feel pretty good about Tennessee's chances with Jabari Small and uh, Vi Cajo if he, you know, if there's room for him in, room for him in this class. I think those are my two, but I'm curious what you guys think. <clears throat> yeah, I would say I would say I probably agree with both of those. Um, you know, Vi Cajo, Tennessee went in home to see him. Really, really good visit. He'll be back out here next weekend. I think Tennessee's got a really good chance there. Um, I think I think they're going to find a spot in this class for him. 
Um, now that they're going to have some shuffling around to do. I've talked to several people this week. I've had several people call me and ask me how these numbers are going to work out. And I said, I, I hope you can tell me because I know it's cliche to say they're going to work their self out, but they're going to somehow have to work their self out. And I, I don't really know where it's going to be. Um, I feel very comfortable with Jabari Small too. Now, now the key with Jabari Small is, is you know, he has the opportunity to sign in February if. If Lane Kiffin comes in and is able to at least get him to reconsider, you know, he's an Ole Miss legacy. It's where his dad played. It's a big deal to him. Um, I think Ole Miss could at least make things interesting for him. But if Tennessee really wants him in this class and this visit this next weekend goes really well and they can get him to sign early, then I, th- I think they have a good ch- a really good chance to get him in too. So uh, I would say probably those two. Brendan, do you, do you have any other name you want to throw in there to, that could be a potential add out of the decommitment group? Uh, there are some other guys that, that Tennessee could potentially get, but as far as the ones I'm most confident with, uh, I'm with you guys. I think it's I think it's Caho and and Jabari Small. I I feel a little better about Jabari Small. I think his relationship with Amari Thomas, and I think Amari's a a heavier Tennessee lean than a lot of people realize. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's gonna that's gonna factor in there. I feel pretty good. I think Ole Miss may have messed up. Uh, I, I know Jabari going to Ole Miss mattered a lot to him. But he was also close with Matt Luke, and I think the way that Matt Luke was treated left a bit of a sour taste in his mouth. Uh, another guy who's going to be interesting, and I don't know that Tennessee is back in on it. I'm trying to find this one out, but it's Elijah Young was just named the Gatorade Player of the Year out of South Doyle yep. High School uh, near Knoxville. He had uh, he'd been committed to Mizzou for a long time. He reopened his commitment this week, so he won Mr. Football for his classification. He uh, it was named Gatorade Player of the Year this year. Tennessee had shown some interest at one point. I don't know what the interest is there now, but I, I would be surprised with a player of that caliber that close to home if Tennessee doesn't kick the tires. As a South Doyle alum, I've, I've obviously followed Elijah pretty closely and, and you know, actually did call South Doyle football games for three years for the streaming service Diamond Clear Media, so I got to watch him you know, firsthand a, a lot of weeks, a week in, a week out when he was younger. I didn't get to see him any um, this year in his senior season, but I got to see him as a freshman, sophomore, junior. And, and from what I saw, he had a lot of flashes of brilliance. And, and, you know, it was just more of can he put it all together? Could he stay healthy? Because he had some injury issues um, early in his high school career, too. And could he prove to be kind of a tougher back and, and pick up tougher yards? Because he had the speed. He, he's got legit 4-3 speed. You can talk about, you know, Jalen Hyatt being a burner. Elijah Young is not far behind him in terms of just how elite speed he has. This year he proved – I mean, he, he was – South Bill essentially was running a, a – wing T offense because Mason Brang, their, their senior quarterback, got hurt early in the year and missed the, the large portion of the season. Elijah Young was getting the ball almost every time, and teams weren't stopping him. He, he totaled over 2,000 rushing yards this year. He proved not only to have a lot of speed, but also to be a, a versatile back and can pick up tougher yards and do a lot of different stuff. So, I, me personally, I don't think, I, I agree with you, Brandon, maybe they kick the tires there. I, I, I think Elijah doesn't want to stay in Knoxville, honestly, um, just from Talking with, uh, obviously, Clark Duncan over there at South Dole. I haven't talked with him in a little bit, but last time I talked with him and just other people I know who were, you know, over at South Dole and doing stuff, I I, I don't know that Elijah maybe wants to stay in Knoxville. That's that's fine. You know, not everyone wants to stay at home. Not everyone wants to play for the hometown school. So I, I think he'll be interesting to watch him decommitting from Missouri. It seems like, though, with the way he worded his decommitment, um, that if they make a, a good hire at Missouri, I think he's very open to – still staying with them if the next coach wants him. Uh, the way he worded it made it sound like in his, his decommitment tweet that um, he's just kind of doing this for now and kind of going to see what happens with uh, maybe you know maybe like an Alante Taylor situation with Tennessee in 2018. Alante Taylor decommitted from the Vols but then ended up you know coming back to Tennessee after Pruitt got hired and they, and they had a you know discussions and things like that too. So I think that it maybe will be a situation where he ends up back at Missouri just depending on uh, who they hire as head coach. Uh, several questions. Actually, someone did ask us about Elijah Young, so uh, we answered that person's question. I'm trying to find who asked that. Oh, Nelson from Jackson asked us that question. Eric McFarland, to kind of touch on here, a couple of guys, we mentioned Kaho already. Eric McFarland asked us, do we think Tennessee has room for Desmond Tisdall, Vi Kaho, and Leonard Whitehead? He also mentioned Jabari Small, but I think they, they do take Jabari Small. But does Tennessee have room for Tisdall, Kaho, Whitehead, and Small in this class? Matt, you just touched on it. Uh, the number is going to be interesting to uh, work out here. Does Tennessee have room for all four of those? If, if they all four want in, obviously. Man, I, I don't know. I mean, if this, 
it really depends. You know, you're going to see what Amari Thomas does. You know, Tyler Barron is obviously, you know, he's a top priority. You know, they're, you know, we just released an interview just right before this podcast started about B.J. Ojolari, who is at least saying that he's going to be receptive to him and hear him out, and they're making a strong push for him, another guy that could sign early. So you know, where do these numbers come from? You know, right now there's spots for seven guys. Um, it's, it's a good situation to have, and you know most of these guys are legitimately considering Tennessee. It's just – where is it going to come from? And, and the combinations, you're not, we're not going to know probably closer until two to three days before signing day as far as where we definitely think these numbers are going to work out. And, you know, and then at the same time, they're trying to, to push Jay Hardy to take this thing back into February. And it seems like they're, they're making some headway there. But, you know, you have, you have the potential to sign your full class in December. So it, it's going to be very interesting. I, I think all four of those guys could end up in this class. But, I, again, you know, it depends on if Omari Thomas ends up in this class, if Tyler Barron, if Tyler Barron stays home. Um, you know, there, and, and, obviously, there's the possibility for decommitments. You know, you, you drop from 18 to 15. If three guys leave the class, then, you know, you're, you're back having to having to get 10 guys. So, you know, it's, it's, it's fun. It's interesting to watch. But I, I really just don't know how they're going to work it all out. But I think absolutely there's a – there's a given combination that all four of those guys could end up in the class. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it Whitehead to me is maybe one of the, the biggest wild cards. I think maybe the biggest wild cards in this class for Tennessee right now, because it, it seemed like for a while that they were trending, you know, very strongly for him. Now it just seems like he's, I don't know. His, his recruitment has been interesting to kind of follow. We've, we've mentioned that before on this podcast multiple times now that he's not been, you know, the most straightforward of recruitments. The same thing for Tisdall. I think he's, he's, I think he's a Tennessee lean at this point, but even his recruitment has kind of uh, moved back and forth a couple different times. So there, there's the linebacker in slash running back positions, or and really the receiver is also another the one to kind of keep an eye on for Tennessee. We'll, we'll kind of touch on the receiver stuff here in a second because I think we had a, a couple questions asked about that. Get Bent Vol sent us in a quite a few. <laughs> like as no. always, we, we appreciate no. that, man. <laughs> uh, he sent us in quite a few. But the one I want to touch on here first, uh, I guess I think a couple of his other ones also bleed into uh, a couple of questions we get asked by other people. But one of his he asked was, what is Tennessee's chances with White, the junior, junior college running back? I think it's Zeandre. I can't remember how you pronounce his first Zaquandre. name. Zaquandre. No. Zaquandre, thank you. What are Tennessee's chances with Zaquandre right, White? excuse me, Brandon, I, I think... What Tennessee does at running back is going to be interesting because White's a name to watch for. They also offered two other JUCO running backs who are committed to other schools. You had Don Ragsdale, who's committed to Southern Miss. And then they, I, I can't remember the guy's name, but they offered a UCLA commit. You also have you know, the possibility of Jabari Small. You have the possibility of, of you know Whitehead, who wants to be running back in, in college as well. I, I, I think White is the most intriguing non-high school player at running back. And, and, and where do you think Tennessee's chances are with him? One thing that Tennessee has done extraordinarily well under Jeremy Pruitt uh, since he got here is they have really recruited the junior college ranks well. Uh, they have done they've done extremely well going to get the guys they wanted. Of course, in Pruitt's first class, he had to go grab junior college guys fast and furious because he needed to get his kind of guys in that class and in the program. And then last year, he really used junior college guys and transfers to alter the defensive front to be more of the three four type defense that he wanted uh, he has done a really nice job of recruiting the guys that he wants and getting the guys that he wants and now Zaguandre White had had been at Florida State had been in some trouble at Florida State uh, I honestly think at this point White is probably a backup plan for Tennessee I think they've got a miss on somebody uh, you look at the running backs you have T. Hodge committed right now who is your, your big power back and I know there's been some talk about looking at him at linebacker as well but right now you've got Hodge listed as a running back. I feel really pretty confident that Tennessee's going to land Jabari Small. I, I think that's probably going to happen. I think they're going to they're probably going to close the deal on him and and manage to land him. So those two right there. Then you've got if you get Whitehead, is he a linebacker? Is he a running back? If you get Tisdall, is he a linebacker? Is he a running back? Uh, you know you you've got options there. I think they're going to have to miss on one or two guys or have something come up where the guys who could flex to running back are going to have to play linebacker 
before they take White. I, I think, but if Tennessee decides they want him and they decide to put a press on for him, I think they've got a good shot because they have recruited junior college guys so well. Uh, if you go back to that first year Pruitt got here, they jumped in on a bunch of guys. Uh, they jumped in on a bunch of guys that nobody thought they had a chance with, that nobody had them in the discussion for. Uh, Dominic Wood Anderson's a good example of that. Uh, he what Tennessee wasn't on his radar. Pruitt gets hired, and you know a few weeks later he's a ball. So uh, Tennessee has shown the ability that they, they know how to communicate with these JUCO kids if there's somebody there they want. Yeah, the uh, Tennessee has done a good job, I think, of, of bringing in some junior college guys who um, have been able to make an impact. You know, <laughs> we'll see about uh, Saban Williams. I think he's been kind of a you know that that was kind of disappointing this year for Tennessee. That Williams didn't make a bigger impact, but but you know Darrell Middleton, for example, did make an impact. Kenneth George Jr. didn't have as immediate impact because he also, for what he got hurt, but he, he played quite a bit of snaps this year. He he ended up playing um, a pretty pivotal role on the defense this year. Jameer Johnson was very pivotal in his first year there. Um, maybe not as much this year. Also, you know, again, battled some injury concerns this year too. But yeah, for the most part, this staff has done a decent job of, of bringing in junior college guys who have been able to. You know, make make at least a, a good enough impact to uh, warrant you know starting or playing quite a bit um, in the rotation. But speaking of which, it, I'm going to go ahead and get to another get bit ball question here, and this will probably be the last one of his. I, I do because I want to. Uh, I don't want to have him monopolize everything. We we appreciate you getting bit ball, but <laughs> you do ask a lot of questions, my dude. Um, he asked, how, "Is there any?" He had a, asked a question about a defensive lineman. Where where did it go? I'm trying to find it here. Here we go. What is the story with Reginald Perry? He seems like a younger Darrell Middleton. Where does Tennessee stand with him? Matt, I think when it comes time to sign the dotted line, I'm going to go make a, and I guess maybe not a bold prediction, but I'm going to make a prediction. I think Reginald Perry is a ball, um, just based off. I think the staff likes him quite a bit. You know, say what you want to about his rankings, offer list, whatever. I think the staff likes Reginald Perry, and, and unless I'm mistaken, I think there's a good chance Tennessee ends up landing him. Oh uh, yeah, I think the the younger Darrell Middleton is is accurate. I mean, you know, he's I think he's got an offer to play tight end um, uh, at UAB. Um, if I read that right, um, on his Twitter profile the other day after we did an interview with him, um, you know, he's he's a big kid. He, he moves. He plays basketball. Um, very athletic. Plays on a basketball team that, that's very very good. Um, you know, one of the top 250 teams in the nation. So, yeah, he's, he's got a lot of athletic upsides for Tennessee. Um, I think I think they've done a really good job recruiting him, getting to campus. I talked to him last week. He's not planning to take any more visits, planning to sign later this month. And that's, that's a pretty good sign for Tennessee, I feel like. Um, but, again, you know, Tennessee's going to get in the situation where if they get some of these guys that they want – and they feel like they have a chance, you know, to, to get Jay Hardy in February, or you know, there's somebody else that they want. Do they try to put Reginald Perry on hold? That's the situation that you get into. I don't know that Tennessee was, is going to do that with him, but there there is the possibility that that it could happen, and that's where things get complicated. I, and and we've seen this happen before. You get a kid, and he you have you feel like he's locked down, and then in February, every other school comes in because 75% of the prospects are gone. So, you know, you got other coaches that are scouring film, filming them, and they come in and make these kids a priority, and they had to wait, and they slip away from you. So, I, I think right now Tennessee's in the best spot to land Reginald Perry, and if he if he has a committable offer and is able to sign during the early signing period, I think I think it'll probably be Tennessee. So. It'll, it'll just be a wait and see type thing, and yeah, I just went back and looked. He he is pretty athletic. He has an offer to play um, tight end at UAB, so um, yeah, he has a he's an offer to play defensive end tight end at UAB. Which, if you remember correctly, Darrell Middleton was a tight end coming out of high school. Yeah, so. and, and Perry, you know, why we're asking, or why he was asking if he's a a younger Darrell Middleton? It's because Perry's got that same frame. He's six foot seven. No, it's he's, huge. He's, yeah, he's six foot kid. seven. Yeah, it, it, like you said, Middleton played tight end at high school. Perry, like you said, he can play kind of both sides of the ball. It looks like he's huge, just like Middleton, who's about six seven as well. So, whew, uh, those are some huge. If, if Tennessee gets both those guys, obviously, I don't think Perry would play um, you know anywhere close to the same type of role that 
that Middleton's going to play next year for Tennessee. But if you have both those guys as options no. on the defensive line at six seven, that's a huge defensive line. And you compare that with a uh, with six foot, you know, three hundred something pound Elijah Simmons, and those are some big beefy dudes up front for Tennessee on the you defensive talk, line next year. You talk about some wingspan and being able to reach out and, and disrupt mm-hmm. throwing lanes, man. Mm-hmm. You yeah, start, that's go ahead. You start talking about Perry and like. Outside of Euros Plavich and John Fulkerson, he's the tallest guy on the basketball team. Yeah, looking at <laughs> I mean, some of the highlights and stuff and pictures from his, his yeah. from basketball too. He's a he's a pretty good basketball player actually. At least for you know where, where he plays, you know basketball. I don't I don't know what yeah. kind of uh, division or how how good the competition is or for where he plays, but still he, he's a another multi sport athlete. You know, can play both sides of the ball. That's that's kind of like the the prototypical Jeremy Pruitt recruit, a guy who can play. Who has and can play on both sides of the ball? A lot of versatility. Yeah, who's, who plays multiple sports? Pruitt loves those type of guys, and so far those type of guys have been you know, pretty successful uh, for Tennessee uh, with with Pruitt as well. Moving on here to a, a few more questions because I guess we got a ton here uh, from a lot of people on here. Chad Keck asks, with the departure of two solid backup offensive linemen, uh, both Marcus Tatum and Ryan Johnson hitting the transfer portal this past week, how many offensive linemen will Tennessee sign? Are there any more new names we're hearing? Right now, Tennessee has four guys committed uh, on the offensive line. All four are listed as interior guys, but there's a, there's a lot of thought that um, Kyrie Miller could be looked at could be looked at as a as a tackle because of his frame and and just kind of you know maybe how he projects at the next level. But Brandon, is there a chance Tennessee brings in a fifth guy? Because you know I, I don't think losing Tatum and Johnson are huge blows. I think they were you know fairly expected. Maybe Brian Johnson a little more of a surprise. It it didn't really surprise me because um, he. I mean, he didn't play hardly this year, and, and I know it maybe surprised people because he's such a big Vol fan, and he even mentioned that in his post about you know moving on. But it's not a huge surprise that either of those guys are moving on to you know find playing time at another school for their um, final year as a grad transfer. But with those guys moving on, with you know you probably are going to be losing Trey Smith with Brandon Kennedy, even if he does get that sixth year of eligibility, you know he's going to be gone after next season. You're going to lose a couple other guys, Jameer Johnson after next season too. Do we see Tennessee bring in a fifth offensive lineman in this class? And if so, you know who might be an option? Well, Tennessee could potentially bring in a fifth offensive lineman by way of doing really well landing defensive linemen. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've said for a long time, uh, I think maybe since our first or second podcast, Amari Thomas, I think, could be an all-SEC flirting by the time he's done at, in college, flirting with an all-American defensive end. And I think putting him on defense is a mistake. He's the most destructive offensive tackle I've ever seen. And he doesn't just block people. He turns people into highlight film. Uh, you're looking at a guy like that, that if you were to, if you're Tennessee and you could potentially flip a guy like a Jay Hardy, if you could, if you could flip Jay Hardy back, you land Octavius Oxendine, you've got Dominic Bailey. I mean, at some point you, you start, you know, if you land a Reginald Perry, if you have a place for him and bring him in, at some point you start looking at Oxendine going, okay, or you start looking at, at, at Amari and going, you know, we're going to give you a shot on the defensive line, but if somebody beats you out, you know, we need offensive line help and you can help there. Uh, I think that's an option. I think, um, Matt, you have talked with me about a former Missouri commit that Tennessee has been looking at, uh, I don't remember the first name, but St. John, also an interior lineman. Tell me a little more about him. Um, you know, Joe and St. John talked talk to him just a little bit early in the week. Tennessee definitely reached out. Um, he has interest in Tennessee, hasn't decided if he's going to set up, a, set up a visit yet. Tennessee, I, that I'm aware of, I don't know that they've been out to see him, but I, I suppose they could have been. He, he hasn't told me if they have. But um, a four-star guy on on one of the recruiting sites, uh, maybe both. But I think there's some interest there. Um, you know, Tennessee still, again, as like you said, recruited the JUCO ranks, and I think there'll be some transfers that they can explore. So there's a lot of options for Tennessee to to be able to to and make to make something happen on the offensive line if they need to. I don't think that they're going to get in a situation where they. I think they like what they have. I know that there's a lot of uh, mixed reviews about Kyrie Miller, um, and I think Tennessee's in the spot right now where they can take a player like Miller and, and work the weight off of him and see what happens. But I think when you really look at it, I think Tennessee is not going to you know, push a spot to an offensive lineman just because of these transfers. I think they could let it work itself out with you know a, a JUCO guy coming in late, somebody coming in late or a transfer 
um, there, there's always the option to, to for that to happen. So, and, um, and in, I'm not going to say that they're going to add a fifth one. One more interesting to watch down down the stretch, maybe Marcus Henderson. That that recruitment has just been strange. It's been strange with everybody. It seems like teams get high on him and they'll drop off, and he's going one place, and then he's not going, and he's a take somewhere, and then he's not a take. Uh, Henderson's a good player. I think he could help Tennessee on both sides of the ball. I think he has the frame and the skill set to potentially play a 3-4 end as well as uh, depending on how you bulk him up, I think he could play guard or tackle. I think he could help you multiple positions. He's out there. I think if Tennessee really pressed, they, they could get in that conversation because his his recruitment has just been really up in the air. So he may be one to to watch out for as things go go on if Tennessee really feels like they need a lineman. That might be some place they go, but I, I don't think the heat's up on him too much right now. One guy I want to talk about that we mentioned earlier and we had another person ask about him, so I'll go ahead and get to this question now is uh, Josh VFL on Twitter. Um, asking about what do you think Tennessee's chances are with Georgia commit Nazir Stackhouse and uh, the athlete slash wide receiver Corey Wren, who just decommitted from Georgia. I wanted I wanted to talk about Wren, but I also I think the Stackhouse conversation is interesting to, to have as well because you guys, you know, you, you reported it first um, that Stackhouse came in as a kind of a, a surprise secret visitor. You know, obviously, Tennessee knew he was coming, but a surprise visitor to the public over the past weekend when Tennessee was playing Vanderbilt. So let's talk about Stackhouse first, and let's have a little bit more of an in-depth discussion about, about Wren because I think he's a very interesting prospect. But, um, Matt, where does Tennessee stand with Stackhouse? Do you, do you think there's a legit chance there to flip him, or is it just a case of, you know, I, I know he's supposed to get another visit, and he's going to officially visit January, Tennessee in January. Um, but to me, it, it just seems, seems like he's still fairly solidly committed to Georgia, but I think Tennessee at least has, you know, has his ear, so to speak. Yeah, that, that, that's the, the right way to say it. Tennessee has his ear. Um, long-standing relationship with Tracy Rocker. Um, you know, been by the school to see him, um, making him feel like a priority. Um, Going to try to get that visit. Talk with some folks at Georgia. He's definitely still taking their class. They really like him. Um, Georgia's going to try to get it. You know, they're going to try to nip it in the bud probably pretty quick. If Tennessee, you know, if they last get that visit, anything can happen going into February. Um, Tennessee has a lot, a lot of opportunity up front, as, as does Georgia. I mean, Kirby Smart showed that he's going to play whoever, the, you know, the best players are. But as far as I think availability to get on the field for Stackhouse, it would probably be Tennessee as a rotational guy and then the opportunity to win a spot as a sophomore. But, yeah, I, I think he's pretty solidly with Georgia, but anything can happen. Let's go into the, the broader discussion here of, of Corey Wren because he, to me, is a very interesting prospect. And we've talked about multiple times what does Tennessee do at receiver. I think obviously they feel a little bit better about the position now with Brandon Johnson redshirting, with D'Angelo Gibbs looking like he's you know flashing a lot of potential in practices and stuff. Um, Tennessee already having Jalen Hyatt committed, looking like a better chance now they're going to keep Jimmy Callaway. I you know that's obviously one to um, keep monitoring and, and seeing kind of where he goes on. Uh, here in the next couple weeks, but it seems like Tennessee's you know got a, a better likelihood of keeping him in this class. But Tennessee's still pursuing some from some guys in the receiver market. Uh, I think Thio Jones Bell that that ship has sailed, I would say. Um, but really, Corey Wren's kind of the the biggest name to pop up recently. Uh, just decommitted from Georgia um, a couple days ago. I think December third, he's going to be officially visiting Tennessee on December thirteenth. He is a fast kid. Um, ran a, it runs a Ooh. ten four forty or not ten four forty ten four second one hundred meter. Um, he Ooh. ran I think like a six eighty sixty meter. So he's a uh, he is a speedster. I think he's a very intriguing prospect. I think if I think if he wants to come to Tennessee. I'm willing to bet Tennessee takes him uh, because that kind of speed, again, if you have that kind of speed with Jalen Hyatt, um, that to me is just a, even if just Ren is a guy who can is only going to contribute on special teams early on in his career, that just the kind of speed, you, you can't teach that speed. That's that's game-changing type of speed, just like with Jalen Hyatt. So I, I, I'm curious your all's thoughts on it because I think Corey Wren, he's going to be interesting to watch. I think Tennessee's very much involved with David Johnson being um, his his lead guy. David Johnson, to me, has been the most under undervalued, kind of underappreciated uh, recruiter for Tennessee staff by, by you know made, made by the fan base and kind of publicly because I think he has done a really good job, specifically this cycle of helping Tennessee with some you know some pretty good targets in this class. 
Johnson's made a big impact, no no doubt. Especially anytime you talk to any of these Memphis guys, it's it's yes. always Coach Yak. That's always the that that's the first name you hear. And if Tennessee wanted to go after all these guys in Memphis, if they really wanted all all of the high end talent out there, uh, I think they could get most of it, if not all of it. And David Johnson's the lead recruiter on all those guys. Wren is an interesting one. He's like all these all these receivers Tennessee's going after in this class. I mean, Tennessee wants speed. There is you. There's no way to misconstrue what Tennessee is trying to build at receiver in this class because everybody they're looking at is just maybe not that big, maybe not that tall, but everybody is blazing fast. Uh, and Wren has that. I mean, Wren has has got that speed. So uh, you put you know him, Jalen Hyatt, Jimmy Callaway on the field together down the road potentially, and you want to talk about a nightmare to have to cover. Now, Matt, you've talked with him a little bit, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I've talked to Green just a little bit. You know, David Johnson's by the school planning a December 13th official visit. Um, Arizona State, who is doing a very good job of recruiting receivers right now, um, maybe you know, play a very fun offense out there. Um, I think they've got two guys um, on campus that are committed to LSU and Alabama today. I, if I saw that headline right, Jermaine Burton and uh, Trey Sean Holden, uh, both top 200 prospects, are visiting Arizona State today. So, you know, Ren is a guy that I think they would like to use. He's, you know, that little shifty receiver that you see in, in their offense that they're able to utilize. They're making a strong push for him. But David Johnson, again, strong Louisiana ties. Um, you know, you talk about him in Memphis, he's, he's Tyson. His ties in Louisiana are a lot more extensive than that. Um, yeah. You know, you, you walk in and you're sitting with David Johnson and you're looking at a guy that, you know, coached Leonard Fournette and Tyron Matthew. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong about that, Nathaniel. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm right. I'll double check that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see. I think he – That's. I mean, like you said, he has a lot of connections in Louisiana. So, uh, let me – let me. You, you keep talking. I'm going to look that up while you're, while you're talking about that really quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it took one stop by the school for Tennessee to get the official visit set up. Um, I think he's a guy, like Brandon said, that Tennessee would like. I think he is a guy that, you know, fits the mold perfectly for what they're trying to do. Um, he's another guy that complicates the number situation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because he's a take. I mean, when when you look around at so many of these guys right now, they're they're all takes, and I don't think Corey Wren's any different. Um, it come down to a case at Georgia of Georgia trying to recruit over him. Now, saying that Georgia obviously feels pretty confident about somebody coming into this class, but Georgia valued him very highly, and he, I don't think you. I think it's a numbers thing for Georgia. They're they're in that complicated situation every year too. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Tennessee's got a legitimate chance at at Corey Wren. You know, you get a guy like David Johnson sitting down face to face with him, telling him what he's done, where he came from, about the University of Tennessee, and then you throw T. Martin into that mix, and you throw Jim Chaney into that mix, who you know was obviously at some point involved with him at Georgia, and. and in all the opportunity in the world at Tennessee, if you're a receiver right now, all the opportunity in the world, one of those speedsters is getting on the field next year in a big role. Well, yep. they're going to they're going to play a lot of time. Um, it is going to be a fun competition to watch. It's going to be one of the more exciting storylines going into camp. So yeah, I think Tennessee's Tennessee's really got a chance there. Matt, I've got a I've got a question for you. I I, I didn't put it on the uh, on the thread, Nathaniel. I hope you'll let me have this one. But yeah. Matt, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm wondering on this from you. I feel like Tennessee's got a good shot with Wren. I feel like they have a good shot with Ramon Henderson. Mm -hmm. If Tennessee comes down to a situation of Wren wants to, to be of all and Henderson wants to be of all, I, I know the numbers are complicated. Is it? Are they to the point where you can only take one, or does Tennessee find a way to take both of them? <laughs> <laughs> When I said my phone rang ten times as we got the numbers, it's questions like that every time. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't get any easier. Go ahead and say what you were going to say, Nathaniel. I honestly think they would take both. But, it, but to me, it would depend on what we, what we touched on earlier, the kind of linebacker position, because 
if Caho and Tisdall both want in, what do you do with Whitehead? I think I think that would affect what they would do with Henderson and Rain. I I think it's really going to depend on. I think they would love if, if both want in. I think they would love to take both. It just you might, and this actually goes into, you know, I think this actually feeds really well to a question I was about to ask you guys uh, that we actually had someone ask. That is at VFL Henry eighty eight on Twitter saying with the class starting to fill up. Do you think any of the current commits, you know, either get sent packing or they look elsewhere themselves? I, I think that I think that's a good way to kind of lead into that question. With if if all of these guys, you know, I don't think all these guys are going to want it. Obviously, you know, obviously Tennessee is going to save spots for you know Darnell Washington. I think I think they would like to they they would save a spot for you know someone else really high on their board, um, whether it's a Caho or a Whitehead or something like that or a Tisdall or whatever. That they're going to save spots for some guys. Washington has a spot no matter what. But, I mean, as we just mentioned, there's 18 guys committed. We think they'll probably sign 25, maybe 26. There's a chance you could have someone be um, a blue shirt candidate, you know, maybe a Jabari Small or something like that. But he's, I think he's visiting, so I don't think he could be a blue shirt candidate. Um, you know, you, you have guys who maybe could be blue shirts um, in this cycle. But at, at, at you know, probably going to sign 25 guys. That leaves you right now seven spots. We've mentioned before, most of the guys who are committed to Tennessee, we think are probably going to stay committed in this class. But... Do we start seeing some guys kind of get, you know, forced out or you know, just kind of, you know, get the, what we're going to call the get shirt? But I think obviously this coaching staff would do a, a better job of it than what we saw Butch Jones. You know, I, I, always, I always think back to the Marquez Ford situation with Butch Jones in that 20, I think it was what, 2016 class, maybe 2017, somewhere around there. I, I can't remember who it was, what year that was now, but he, you know, Marquez Ford was committed and then just a, like a couple weeks before signing day was told to to move on I think that's I think that was when they got Kyle Phillips so that would I guess that would have been 2015 class but anyway um do we start seeing some guys get told to send packing I, I, I don't want to speculate on on who um because I don't think that's fair to the kids but uh, do we see some guys start telling you know this, this coaching staff say hey maybe we uh maybe it's in best interest for both parties to for you to look elsewhere I can think of three guys yeah I, I can think of I can think of at least two yeah, and I think I, I think there's probably a possibility that you see you in case that. And that's my that's my least favorite part of the entire thing. Yeah. Um. You know, you hate to see that. Um. It, it's it's bad on both parties. You know, it, these coaches care about these kids. They're recruiting them to come be the building blocks of their program. Program. You know, part of the success of their job. They didn't let them commit to 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 hurt them down the line. You know, that, that's never the intention, but, you know, it's it's a business, and that's the nature of the beast. Um, you know, I, there there's some opportunities for Tennessee to, to do a lot of things, I think. Um, you know, talking about the skill position specifically, you know, Brandon, I know you and I have talked. You think that Jimmy Calloway is a little bit of a project once he steps on campus. Uh, you know, I actually think you've said, you know, he's, he's going to require a lot of work. You know, a, a really good athlete, but he's, he's going to be a guy that he's very raw going to require a lot of work you know Oklahoma's come on and pushed for Jimmy Callaway to be a defensive back is there any way that Tennessee moves him over there and then says hey we, we still need an, another couple of receivers we can take Wren and and uh Henderson you know if, if the numbers with the linebackers work out I think that's where it becomes tricky so I don't know you if you're Tennessee right now and you're in this situation and all these guys want in somebody's getting the get shirt I feel a like, lot because there's a couple of guys most of these guys right now are, are better than a couple of these guys in the class, but it becomes to Tennessee, what type of priority is it at the position? You know, do you need this position this much more than you need a player at this position? Um, if it becomes some uncertainty over what position a player is going to be, if there's, you know, a tweener role and you don't feel like they can make an immediate impact right away, then that could, you know, that could leave you the option to, you know, Explore that could leave the option for Tennessee to tell the guy to explore other options. It's going to be interesting again. I'm, it, I, you know, it's it is a true number crunch. Right? I don't know any other way to put it. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy. I think we do do a podcast next week, um, or maybe after early signing period, just to, to talk about the numbers because I think that's that's kind of one of the most talked about questions. That we we've been asked different things on at least with RTI and our, our regular mailbag stuff about. Um, you know, scholarship, the scholarship situation and, and, you know, how that's all playing out. So those are kind of two of the bigger questions that I'm sure um, a lot of people are going to keep asking here in the next couple of months. And speaking of the early signing period, that we got this, we got asked this by multiple people. 
And this might be one of the last questions. Uh, maybe I, I think I'll do one more after this one. Um, but we got asked by multiple people, um, who's signing early of Tennessee's 18 uh, current commitments? I, I know, obviously, Harrison Bay is expected to sign early. Keyshawn Lawrence is expected to sign early. I would imagine Cooper Mays probably is, too. I think Jalen Hyatt as well. So do you guys know, do you, do you all have, you know, who all you've talked to and stuff, do you know who all is expected to be signing early for Tennessee? But the early signing period begins December 18th. Uh, I think it runs, I guess, through the 20th, I think, is when that ends. So from the 18th to 20th, um, who should we expect to see of Tennessee's commitments right now to be signing early? All of the guys that you just mentioned, I do believe are signing early. Um, Dominic Bailey is signing early. Um, is the Whitehaven trio, are they signing early? They are signing early. Um, we talked about that in a in an interview with Tamarion McDonald. They're all three going to sign early. They were not sure when they were going to sign. There was some issue about them going to. Um, they they, they want to sign together. That's how tight knit they are. They want to sign the papers together. It, it's a very big deal to them. And Brandon can can speak to that. But they want to sign together. And it was you know they didn't know if they could if. A couple of them didn't know if they could sign in December or not, but they're they're all signing in December. Um, Jimmy Callaway is not signing early. Mordecai McDaniel haven't heard if he will sign early. Art Green may sign early, but he's not an early enrollee. Um, right. Not sure on Javon Tess Braggins. I believe T. Hodge will probably sign early. Jamari Butler is obviously not going to sign early. Kyrie Miller has not made a decision yet if he's going to sign early. We're still talking about it with, with his family and his coaches. Um, and then Darion Wimps, and you know that's that's a name that you haven't heard a whole lot out of. I don't expect him to sign early. Uh, Will Albright, the long snapper, probably signing early. I would imagine <laughs> he seems he seems. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, it's probably probably a good call too. <laughs> if you start talking about this numbers <laughs> crunch, if you're a long snapper and you can sign early, sign early. Yeah, I, I think I, I do think though he would he'd be safe anyway because I think Pruitt. Um, really they need him. they they've yeah they've got to have a long snapper. Yeah, not only that, but he's also he's a guy for Greenville, um, Tennessee, where he plays. He, he actually plays multiple positions. He plays uh, some receiver for them. I think he plays maybe defense too. But he he plays multiple spots actually. He's he's just kind of an athlete for uh, Greenville. Obviously, you know he probably won't get talked about a whole lot. We haven't heard a whole lot talked about uh, Ryan Loving Good here until his his senior season at Tennessee. But yeah, I think Will Albright would be. Uh, I think he'd be safe anyway, even if he didn't sign early. But I, I do think he's probably another guy who is going to sign early. Last question that I want to cover here. We, we've got a couple more I probably could cover. Um, but I want to, in the interest of time and keeping this not an hour-long podcast, I want to go ahead and finish up here with this one from Serpentitious on Twitter. Uh, I think we also, a, a couple other people asked the same question or a similar one to it. It says, how likely is it that UT will finish in the top 10 to 15 recruiting wise, I think, and we've talked about this before, or I, I think we've also been asked about it before on the RTI mailbag on rockethopinsider.com, uh, both Ben McKee and I, I think in order for Tennessee to finish closer to that top 10 rather than, uh, you know, around 15, I think they're going to have to get Darnell Washington. I think they'll have to get um, Amari Thomas. They'll have to get Tyler Barron. Um, they'll, they'll have, to, you know, maybe Lynette Whitehead because those are obviously some of the higher rated guys that Tennessee is still pursuing. I think in order to get to closer to the top 10, you're going to have to get, you know, Darnell, who's a five-star, and probably, you know, another, probably another at least three, maybe four, four-stars. But that, I, I think outside of Tennessee, just absolutely <laughs> and getting, you know, the highest-rated guys left on their board, I think Tennessee will probably finish close to around that, that 12th, 13th range, you know, similar to what they did last year, um, where they finished around 13th, around 12th last year. Um, I, I think you'll see Tennessee finish probably right around that same spot. Right now, I, I actually, you know, I, I mentioned this in the mailbag this week on RockyTopInsider.com. I'm going to go a little bold and go ahead and say I think Tennessee gets Darnell Washington, um, the five-star, to, to sign with Tennessee. I think they have a good shot, obviously, of getting uh, Tyler Barron and uh, Amari Thomas. And they have a decent, we've talked about before on this podcast, they have a decent shot of being able to flip Jay Hardy back. It's just a matter of how everything goes between now and uh, February with him, but I, I think there's a good chance you see Tennessee add another at least three, if not four, if not five, you know, four star or better players in this class between now and you know once everything gets finalized in February. I think there's a good chance of Tennessee ending up with. I, I feel confident they'll end up between ten and fifteen. I wouldn't be surprised to see them get to ten. May if things go really well, I think they might be even able to get up to as high as nine. But I feel I feel very confident they're going to wind up being able to be in that ten to fifteen range. 
What about you, Matt? Yeah, I think so. I, I'm. I think it's going to kind of be closer to the eleven thirteen number. I, I, I said for a little while. I thought that they could get to to ten, and they, and they still may. Um, they they still may. And like you said, they knew you add in a, a Darnell Washington, an Omari Thomas, a Tyler Barron, and that's, that's two. That's three top, you know, one hundred guys right there. Uh, Tisdall is a guy that has really soared. His you know, he could get a bump in the ratings at the end. Um, you know, Lenny Whitehead he he didn't play due to injury for a good portion of the season. So does he does he drop right now? He's a top one hundred guy, but could he could he take a drop because? You know, there's some lack in senior film. We saw that. Um, we've, we've also saw you have great senior film. You dropped too. Um, <laughs> but who, who was that about, Matt? <laughs> unbelievable. Um, but I, I think I think it's the 11 to 13 number. Um, you know, if you, you get a four star like Henderson, you know, out of out of California, you know, Corey Wren's a guy. If you if you got him, you could get a bump. Yeah, Tennessee could clean up. They they could make a push for that top ten class. I, I believe it's eleven to thirteen though. Um, and I think that's where I think that's I think that's probably a good range for them. I mean, I when you look at what, where they were and how slow this recruiting class has been, um, there's going to be a lot of excitement in the next um, you know, 10, 12, 14 days here. But it's going to you can't. It's going to be hard to complain about a finish like that after starting zero two to BYU and Georgia State. Yeah, and, and actually, I lied. There's you, you both kind of brought it up there. There's actually one more thing I want to talk about, and that is actually uh, some of the most recent recruiting update rankings. And we, we won't see the, the the finalized stuff hasn't happened obviously yet, um, but we did see rivals kind of update their stuff. And I, I don't I don't think two more seven has updated theirs yet, but we we did see rivals update their rankings and. Two names, or I guess three names I want to mention. Jalen Hyatt got his fourth star on the composite for 247, so I'm, I'm glad for him. Um, he, he definitely deserves that. He deserves to be higher rated than what he is, just in, in general, but I, I'm glad to see he got his fourth star. But then, um, would you, do you know how he started the state championship game today? How was that? The uh, In his fourth consecutive state championship game from Dutch Fork, on the first play of the game, he catches an 80-yard touchdown pass. <laughs> Good Lord, that, so, kid is, that kid's incredible. Uh, he really is. But, but speaking of uh, more incredible performances, getting to state titles and stuff, we just saw Harrison Bailey on Friday put together probably his best performance of his senior season. 23 or 26, over 400 passing yards, five touchdowns, one pick, and he caught a touchdown pass. So he has six total touchdowns uh, in that game. 400 passing yards was almost perfect through the air. Um, helped Marietta get to their first state title game since 1967, uh, where they'll be taking on an undefeated um I cannot remember the name of the team they're out to face. So they, they beat Parkview 42-31. Lowndes County. Thank you, yes. Um, he, however, did not get his fifth star on Rivals. We, we I, I saw one of the Rivals analysts say that he believes Harrison Bailey should be a, a five-star. He obviously hasn't been moved on 247 yet. And we also saw Bryson Easton, for some reason, take a, a pretty big drop. He dropped like 100 spots in the composite um, on 247. I don't know what, what all he dropped on Rivals, but... Let's talk about, very briefly here, I don't want to spend too much time on it as we close up the podcast here, but why did Bryce and Eason drop, and do we expect to see Harrison Bailey with this? I mean, he's had a stellar senior season. Uh, so why did Bryce and Eason drop, and do we expect to see Bailey, I don't know say maybe get a fifth star, but do we expect to see him overall become, you know, deep, get back into the top 100 and all the major recruiting services after this strong season he had? So when you look at the two four seven composite, which we're getting is a mixture of two four sevens, top two four seven rankings, which you know it goes farther than that, but it's it's a mixture of what they call the top two four seven. You're getting the rivals rankings, um, and they do theirs a little differently, and then then you're getting the ESPN rankings, which are drunk people, pretty <laughs> pretty, and and no offense, and no offense to those guys over there, yeah, just not. Not very good rankings. You look at – I don't remember who I was looking at the other day. The last time this kid's profile was updated was um, July, of 2000, July of this year. So, I mean, he's had 15 – this kid's had 15 more offers. Since, so, they, they, you know, they're not that in-depth with their recruiting, but, they, you know, they get the signing day highlights and all that other stuff. So, it's a – they use the TV to their – to their ability, but you know, you get all this. Bryce and Eason's you know, drop in the two four seven composite co- come came from him dropping forty spots, you know, in the rivals ranking. So uh, people around him, you know, moved up the 
the drop in the rivals rankings dropped him that far in the two four seven composite rankings. So and he's he's already around you know they have him rated like six hundred and something in in their top two four seven rankings. How, so how do you, you know, how do you have a season as a middle linebacker on one of not just the best defenses in the state but one of the best defenses in the country playing pretty darn good competition. This kid was a Mr. Football finalist playing exclusively middle linebacker for this team and deserved to be there. What else does he have to do? Yeah, and, and I mean, that's the thing. These, I, I think, and I guess you have to be. I mean, when you, and, and I, I, I talked to you about this, Brandon, because, you know, it, it is it is aggravating at times. Like, you know, I'm, I was talking now, obviously, um, I was taking a subtle shot about Harrison, you know, dropping in the rankings with, with senior film, and, and that's because I've watched Harrison a lot. You know, I, I guarantee you, I've watched Harrison in person this year more than, than any, um, you know, recruiting analyst. You know, watching his film, you know, watching it. What there's a lot more that goes into it for me, um, I'm, and I'm not doing it obviously, but you know, there's a lot more out there to it than that. Um, but I know you have to get in depth. But when you, when you talk about Bryce and Eason dropping. 100 spots just because he dropped 40 on, you know, like 100 spots in the 247 composite because he dropped 40 spots in the rivals composite. That's why, you know, I I consistently try to tell people that really, I, I'm going to say from like the top 500 especially, but you could go almost out to the top 700 of these, you know, these rankings um, on 247 and from 700 to 300, Maybe even down to 250, these guys are almost interchangeable. They're 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 superb athletes. They 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 are very well rounded athletes. But they're maybe they're not you know maybe it's just one thing on film that causes somebody to drop 40 spots. That that's how critical these rankings are, and that's how close these guys are. At, you know, at the level of competition that they play at, and and their natural ability. And then once you, I think you get inside the top 200, you start talking about guys inside the class that are truly you know elite guys and then working your way down you know you get to the elite of the elite um so it, it's a very it's a very fickle line it's a very um it's a very um it's a very wealthy process for those guys that make those rankings they're, they're generating clicks they're able to you know, write articles off guys dropping guys rising you know debate topics it, it it's a healthy business um and, and it, it's fun too i mean it's it's I think it's fun for fans to interact and see their guys jump, and I think it's fun for fans. I, a lot of fans like to debate. It, it's it's a good it's a good business. It, it does get frustrating to an extent because you know, like you say, I saw Harrison Bailey um, four times this year, uh, counting last night. He's been over three hundred yards and four touchdowns every game I've saw him, like against really good seven A competition in Georgia. And you, you're just looking around like, you know, how how does a kid drop? And, you know, other kids are having great seasons. Like Bryce Young, you know, I know the, the oh, yeah. talk about the Alabama bump, but Bryce Young had a great season at modern day. He showed that his arm was a, was a lot better than people gave him credit for. So, you know, there's – it's a lot of times guys moving up around you that had seasons that were just as good or better or maybe they showed some. Maybe maybe this guy is a, is a super, you know, athlete – but these analysts were waiting on one thing to see, one thing to click for them, and maybe it clicked. Maybe maybe they're deserving of it. Now, Harrison's consistency, maybe Harrison's consistency to them right now is only you know where he's ba- bounced back and forth at for rivals. I don't know. I, I can't get into that process, but I just think there's so much that goes into it. It's it's a never ending process. I think that's what makes it fun, but I think that's what makes it you know skewed at times too. So if that makes any sense. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Bryce Young's senior season. He had at Mater D, um, 73% completion percentage on se- or on 368 passing attempts, 4,000 yards, 53 touchdowns, three interceptions. Yeah. He also ran for almost 400 yards and 10 touchdowns. So, I mean, yeah, that's a uh, that is a monster season. It's not like he's playing small ball. I mean, Mater D is a premier, yeah, Mater yeah. a premier uh, program. So you know that you know they're playing some really good competition and stuff. And, and but the same thing for Harrison Bailey. He's not like he's played against weak competition. He's playing his six A high school football in Georgia. I mean that's that's pretty that's probably his premier you're gonna get in the South. 
uh, especially. Um, it, he, yeah, he's, and quite, he's played against some really good teams, and he's going to play against a really good team in the uh, in the finals this, this upcoming week too. Yeah, and Coach Morgan had those guys play a national schedule the last two years. Played St. John's College, um, mm-hmm. played St. Joe's Preps out of Pennsylvania, played Edgewater out of Florida. So you got that's three top one hundred teams that they played right there, and no drop, no drop in production. I mean, everybody saw what Harrison did on ESPN. And I think if you're a Tennessee fan and you follow this avidly, it, it does, you know, it does grow on you. I, I can see why it would grow on somebody for, for there, you know, there to be some frustration there. Um, but it's all part of the process. It's, it's all funny yeah. games. Um, ultimately, it, those rankings do not determine what you're going to do in college, and those rankings do not determine what kind of player you are. And coaching evaluations are are everything now, um, and the way that these coaches can evaluate talent getting kids you know th- through campus two or three times and, and being able to you know get this camp film the way that they can and get everything that they need and there's so many opportunities it, it ultimately comes down to to your film um right and rusty manzel a, a guy that i really like writes for georgia side and, and runs a georgia elite classic he'll tell you the, the friday night films what makes it not not those star rankings yeah, uh, 100% agree with you. By the way, as we end this podcast here, I just want to give you all, uh, listeners, Harrison Bailey's season stats for Marietta this year in comparison to uh, to Bryce Young's there. 69.3% completion percentage on 362 pass attempts, exactly 4,000 yards, 44 touchdowns, 9 interceptions, and he also has a run for almost 100 yards and three scores. So he's been a little more mobile this year. That was one thing that was been kind of a knock on him was his mobility. Um, Bailey just put up a phenomenal year. Uh, M- uh, Mike Willard on Twitter, who covers Marietta High School football, he's also, uh, I think he went to Tennessee. He's at least a Vol fan. Yeah, he's, he's a Tennessee grad. He's also a Vol fan. Uh, he, he's been posting a lot of stuff about Harrison's senior season. Right now, Bailey um, and his career at Marietta, 11,445 career passing yards with 114 touchdowns. Uh, Mike added on here for reference. Peyton Manning had 7,207 career yards and 92 touchdowns at Newman. So, obviously not trying to put that kind of stuff on Bailey to say he's going to be the next Peyton Manning, but that's just still – and obviously offenses have evolved quite a bit since Manning was in high school, and that was like you know, 25 years ago. But that's still uh, very, very impressive stuff by Harrison Bailey in high school. But, guys, we're going to go ahead and end the podcast here. We, we had a few more questions we probably could have gotten to. Um, there's still stuff we didn't get to cover in this podcast that it, we'll, we'll probably cover in a future podcast. But guys, before we do end it here, I want you all to plug some stuff you have coming down at VR2 because, as you mentioned, you know, you all get to talk to the recruits. And but we, we'll, we're trying to get some more recruits and stuff to talk here at RTI, but you know, this is a very busy time of the year. Recruits aren't talking as much now as they were, obviously, you know, months ago. But what do you guys have at VR2 right now? I know the BJ Ojolari uh, interview that you just had put out here before you start recording this podcast. You have that. And what else do you want to plug at VR2? Oh, uh, yeah. So Monday, um, Amari Thomas announces Monday we, we will be there. Um, Brandon is for sure planning on going. Um, if everything works out for me, um, I, I will also be there. So you'll have some have some pieces coming out of Briarcrest. Um, you know, a live feed of Amari's announcement. Um, that's set for 10 a.m. Central Time, right, Brandon? Yep, that's the that's the current announcement time is set for 10 a.m. Okay, um, and then then um, you know it's it's pretty much going to be signing day. Then we'll have some guys that are you know going to probably be on campus this weekend for visits. Um, we'll have some guys popping in next week, but we'll we'll be gearing up for signing day and we'll be getting some primers ready for signing day, trying to get you guys times where we're going to be. Going to have a lot of coverage. Probably going to have five to six guys on the ground on signing day at different places. So. Hopefully a whole whole live day of signing day um, for you guys. Um, there's there's so many spread out over the southeast. Not sure how it's going to work yet. Just waiting on announcement at times. But you know, obviously we'll be there for Tyler Barron's announcement at Knoxville Catholic. Um, trying to get to see. I think I'm going to be at Octavius. I think I'm going to be at Octavius Oxendines. Is that that still the plan? Yeah, um, and trying trying to get down there to see Harrison Bailey, and obviously, um, you know, Tennessee's working hard on BJ Ojolari. If you want to check that article out, they're at least trying to get him a decision to make on that day if he if they can. Um, so, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of things coming up, and then it'll slow down for just a little bit. And if you know, depending on the numbers that Tennessee signs, we'll see some new targets emerge, and if not, we'll start getting ready for camp season if they sign a full class. But camp season is just right around the corner, so. You know, go ahead and, and get ready, and we'll be ready to go. 
check us out at vr2.site and at vr2 on all social media. Yep, they are fantastic. As you just said, vr2.site at underscore vr2 underscore on Twitter. And they have a Facebook and Instagram as well. We are RockyTopInsider.com. We're Rocky Top Insider on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. A lot of you listen to this, uh, on the podcast on YouTube. We appreciate that very much. If you haven't subscribed already, you definitely should. And like I said, go follow us on all our social media stuff as well. Signing off for Matt and Brandon, I am Nathaniel Rutherford. And this has been another episode of the RTI and VR2 Recruiting Podcast.